to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Just as we promised in last week's episode, today we are going to bring you an awesome interview with Captain Kirk Saddle Morrow, where we discuss NJEPT. Colin, this has been a highly requested podcast episode. Not just highly requested, the most highly requested topic interview from all of our audience, and rightly so. A lot of the pilots that we've brought in to talk about their experiences have passed through this program, and anybody who knows about the rated career fields is interested in becoming a pilot eventually learns about NJEPT and the prestige that goes into the selection process, the training that everybody's going to hear about here in a second. So yeah, totally understand why everybody wants to hear about it, and we're super excited to bring this interview, especially with Saddle because he's fantastic. Everybody's going to really enjoy hearing from his experiences. Yeah, totally agree. And what a humble guy. He goes into it, but the guy has a master's degree from five years in Stanford. He's <laughs> clearly highly capable and very talented. Yes. But he doesn't come off that way. And something too, I think, Colin, one of the reasons this is of interest is we're a competitive bunch. Yeah. We're a bunch of high flying, really high achievers who strive for excellence. And if there's a cut to make it in the Air Force and a cut to make it to be a pilot and there's another cut to get to NJEP, boy, people want to try for it. Oh, yeah. And that's one thing I love about being an airman. But yeah, really looking forward to it. And I think with that, we should turn it over to Colin Slade and Captain Kirk Saddle Morrow. All right. Saddle, welcome to the show. We are super excited to have you. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. No, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I have to say up front that the topic of NJEPT, Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training, is the most requested interview that we've had so far in almost a year and a half that Reed and I have been doing this podcast. So people are so dang excited to hear from you, Saddle. Well, I just hope that I can provide some valuable information for those who are interested in the program. I will certainly do my best. Yeah. So this is also going to be good for me because, I mean, I know what NJEPT is. I at least know the acronym, and I know that it's located at Shepard Air Force Base in Texas. You know, beautiful Wichita Falls, right? <laughs> but that's about the extent of my knowledge. We have interviewed a number of different flyers on this show, many of them have gone through the NJEP program, but I really don't know that much about it. And I know our audience is excited to learn more. So this is going to be a great conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. But before we get into any of that, let's learn a little bit more about Saddle. Give us your background, where you're from, what led you to join the Air Force? How did you uh, commission? How did you earn your wings? What was all that like? And then we'll go from there. Okay. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I grew up in an army family. My dad, yeah, I know, right? Uh, yeah, my dad was a West Point grad okay. and had a full career in the army. So uh, the first, what, six years of my life, we moved around like five times, I think it was. So that was kind of my experience as a young kid. And my dad retired from the army when I was in elementary school. And I ended up settling in Colorado Springs. Okay, cool. So I spent most of my school years there in Colorado Springs, very close to the Air Force Academy and got, you know, some of that exposure uh, growing up and was trying to figure out what I wanted to do for college. But just by virtue of being in a military family, just figured that was something that was meaningful to me. And I started to gravitate toward the Air Force side of the house thinking about a pilot pipeline potentially. So for colleges, I was fortunate. I got accepted into Stanford out in California. Okay. So went to Stanford and did ROTC Crosstown at San Jose State University. So I did a full, actually five years of ROTC there, five years of college and then commission. And out of ROTC commissioning, I picked up a pilot slot and was lucky to get an NGIPT slot as well. So Okay. Very interesting. So just want to make sure I understand this. You got accepted to Stanford. 
That's right. So that's where you went to school, but you did ROTC at San Jose. That's exactly right. Yeah, for colleges, like not every college will have an Air Force ROTC program. Right. If there is an ROTC program that's nearby several colleges, then students at all those colleges will commute to one central location to experience ROTC and then commission from there. So that's what I did, basically. I went to college, did my courses at one place, and then drove 35 minutes down the road a few times a week uh, to participate in the ROTC gig. Yeah. What was that experience like having to commute to a different campus, not your own, not your university, in order to participate in the ROTC program? It was certainly an interesting experience in some ways. I would say it was, it caused me to grow up for sure, because it just added some complexity to the college experience that I had to figure out. Yeah. And there are more complexities to it, actually, that are probably worth going into here on the podcast. But like freshmen at Stanford aren't even supposed to have a car. Oh, really? I had to figure out early on, like, how am I going to commute down to San Jose State and this whole thing? But at the end of the day, it was really a phenomenal experience because I was able to have two distinctly separate experiences through college, which I had my college life with my college friends, but then a really close-knit community as well over at San Jose State in the ROTC world. And so, I don't know, it was really rewarding on both fronts. And then I was especially lucky as well because my girlfriend at the time, now wife, happened to be at San Jose State as well. So it gave me also an excuse to go down there to see her, and it was a good setup, all things considered. There are definitely some frustrations that went along with it in terms of the commute and all that stuff, but all in all, it was a positive experience. Yeah, see, I was going to say that having to do the commute and overcome all of that additional complexity made you really commit to the Air Force. Like, you had to know that this was what you really wanted in order to get through all of that. But then you said that there was a girlfriend there that you were going to go see, and then all of that just went right out the window for me. So I see how things went here. Yeah, no, it was definitely a perk, but you're right. It was challenging. And to be honest, there are a lot of population of crosstown cadets in a detachment is usually pretty thin. Yeah, It does require some extra commitment to do it for sure. Yeah, that was my experience as cadre for ROTC. We had a crosstown that was only 10 minutes away. And even Mm -hmm. with that short commute between the two universities, there were far too many qualified and interested people, students who would have made fantastic officers for the Air Force who just wouldn't do it because they didn't want to have to drive those 10 minutes. Then again, you know, the Air Force is probably better for not having that kind of person among our ranks, right? That's right. That's probably right. There is a built-in filter here, and this is true across all commissioning sources, that whether it's going to the academy and having to go through all of the application process, getting nomination, as well as just the whole academy experience, the different inefficiencies associated with ROTC and also just the sheer amount of time and Herculean effort that's required to get into OTS. All of these things serve as a filter for people who have to be truly committed to becoming an officer and serving the country, or you're just never going to get in, right? Yeah, it's just like a built-in screening process of sorts. Yeah, no, I agree with all that. Well, very good. So while you were going through ROTC, what did you study? So I studied civil engineering Oh, okay. uh, at Stanford was my degree. Yeah. And I actually had a, like a, I don't know, really good deal at Stanford. They offered a, they called a co-terminal master's program, something maybe you've heard of. I think other universities do it as well, but basically you can work on your bachelor's and master's simultaneously. Yeah. And so I was able to take advantage of that. And since I was doing a technical degree in ROTC, they allotted five years of time. Yep. So I was just super fortunate. I took advantage. I took five years and then I graduated at the end of five with a bachelor's and master's, which was uh, just a great deal for sure. Yeah. And awesome to come into the Air Force with your master's already done and not have to worry about that for the rest of your career. Very fortunate to have been able to do it because I've been deployed downrange with friends who are sweating finals and papers and all that stuff, working through their masters. So uh, yeah, definitely lucky. That's really good. And then also having the built-in backup of civil engineering as in the event that maybe you didn't make it through pilot training, you could still have done civil engineering for the Air Force. I'm biased you know, toward that. So that would have been excellent. Or if the Air Force just in general didn't work out for you, you've got a great degree, a very hireable career path there as a possibility for you. Yeah, I would like to think so. At this point, I feel like my engineering skills have probably deteriorated just a little bit. Yeah. But, but at the time, it was a great plan B for you, I think. Absolutely. Definitely. Okay, so you studied civil engineering, but the intent was not to become a civil engineer. At least you were selected for 
pilot, you got an NGIP slot. Was that always the intent going into ROTC that you knew you wanted to be a flyer or talk to us how that came about? Yeah, sure thing. So growing up in a military family, I don't know, my parents just instilled into me a desire to serve my country, right? And so right. that was always plan A, it was just to serve my country in some capacity. And I was not set on the pilot path at all. Like I certainly wasn't the five-year-old kid that would go to air shows or, you know, dress up in a flight suit and just watch Top Gun on repeat and know that that was what I was destined to do or anything. That's what you do now. Every evening, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was something that appealed to me because I just didn't think that a desk job nine to five was going to appeal to me. I felt something more dynamic and challenging and you know, just that would you know change on a daily basis. I thought that was going to be kind of more my cup of tea. And it was more like it wasn't really from the, the outset of ROTC that I was thinking about doing that. I was just exploring options, thinking about it. And it really wasn't until it was time to apply for rated positions that I said, I think I would enjoy this pilot route. So I'll go ahead and put in for it. Yeah. And, you know, you were probably 21 at the time and yeah, something like that. And yeah. you had your whole world, the rest of the next 50 years of your life completely plotted out. You knew exactly what you wanted to do, right? <laughs> well, not really. I don't know. Not really. It was, it's, it, it yeah, it's probably more <laughs> organic than that, I'd say. But uh. <laughs> so the opportunity presented itself. Yeah. You were prepared, at least were qualified. And so you threw your name into the hat and something about you, you had the secret sauce that not only got you selected for, pilot to get a rated slot, but also to go to NJET. So what was it about your preparation, your ROTC experience, your scores, your cadet ranking, or all of those different things that enabled you or might enable somebody else who is interested in going this route to get selected? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I would say you got to be committed and you got to do your best are kind of the vague, simple ways to go about it. And I think there's a lot to be said for the expression, you got to make your own luck. Okay, yeah. And so, I don't know, you know, the way I approach most things in life is that I just try to never have a door closed to me, right? So I just worked really hard in ROTC. I, I tried to be, you know, a good team player, try to learn the skills that they were teaching me at the time, try to get them down cold. If it was memorizing quotes by whoever it may be, you know, John I was trying Stuart to- Mill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you just try to do well at whatever the task is at hand, such that you start to stand out a little bit, right? And maybe then you get trusted with a leadership position. Yeah that you have the opportunity to excel at. And so there's an element of just doing well in the actual ROTC program, right? And excelling amongst your peers. But I think the key to success in doing that is to just be a good person and a good teammate, never ever trying to step on the other folks around you to get there. Just contribute, you know, is kind of, I think, the key on that, on that side of it. That one, I'd say, is a little bit more difficult to control. The easier things to control are the other components of your like cadet score cadet ranking which include yeah. gpa i think a lot of people discount just how important your gpa is right when it comes to like your ranking and stuff so if you want to set yourself up for success then do well in your classes which is yeah. you know, unfortunately your, yeah. the air force is one of the few places on planet earth that actually cares about your gpa <laughs> true but you know we need to have something to differentiate the candidates and that's a pretty standardized one that has yielded frankly pretty good results for better or for worse about the actual gpa itself and what it may mean but those who have a high gpa tend to do pretty well in the air force yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, I suspect that there would be some correlation with folks with decent GPAs and you know, who perform well in really any job, probably with the Air Force and, and obviously exceptions to all that. But that's just something that I think you can make your own luck there, right? If you can do well on just in classes, that bodes super well. And then along those lines as well as physical fitness, right? Just keep right. your physical fitness high, kind of set the standard for your peers in ROTC, which helps you stand out in that regard. And then also the PT score, I, I think, is a substantial portion of your cadet ranking. So all those things. And then I think the other like little components of your cadet score, at least when you go up for these rated boards, is the, uh, the silly Pixum score, I think they call it. Yeah. Pilot candidate selection method, I think is. That is exactly right. Yep. All right. Nailed it. So I think there are a few things that go into that, like your AFOQT, like pilot nav scores. Yeah. The TBAS test scores, which for those of you in the commissioning sources may be familiar with that, but it's a really interesting like hand-eye coordination, memory, task management uh, exercise, and you get an aptitude at the end of that for how well you do. Yeah, and that stands for the test of basic aviation skills, the TBAS, yep. There you go. And then the last component, I think, is just how many flight hours you have. 
And so like, honestly, I knew a lot of guys in ROTC who would go into taking like the AFOQT or something without having looked at a study guide or prepared right. for it or something like that. And I just think if you're serious about pursuing pilot training or an inship slot, then you need to make your own luck and dive into some study guides, ask people who have taken it for uh, recommendations and whatnot. And even the TBAS test, even though it's a real-time aptitude thing, there's some information out there that can help you set up for success on that stuff. So if you make your own luck, don't go anything cold. I think that's what's going to set yourself up for success for a high cadet ranking and the best shot at grabbing a pilot slot and ultimately maybe an inship slot as well. Yeah, absolutely. Reed and I talk all the time about controlling the things that you can control and just accepting the things that you cannot. And I think that calling it making your own luck is a very similar way of describing the same principle that people need to prepare, be deliberate, make the effort on the things that actually matter that they can control and then everything else it's out of your control. And so there's nothing you can do about it. You don't get to decide the commander's ranking, the 05, the 06, they're the ones that will choose the difference between a number one and a number two. And you don't get any say in that. Right. No, totally. And everything you can do to make your own luck. Uh, and another saying that I don't know, I hear a lot with my peers here in the Air Force and whatnot is timing is everything too. Yeah. You just Never know what timing is going to throw your way. Yeah, in terms of how many pilot slots are available or what's going on in the world. So you got to set yourself up and then hope for the best kind of thing. Absolutely. Okay, so it worked out pretty well for you. You managed to, again, not only get selected for pilot, but to go to NJEPT. And then you can talk us through the basics of your career up to this point. But now you're back at NJEPT again, right? That's right. So yeah, walk us through how that happened. Yeah, sure. I ended up attending NJEP for pilot training. And out of NJEP, my assignment was to go fly the F-15E Strike Eagle. Okay, cool. So after my time at NJEP, which consists of like the pilot training program until you get your wings, and then followed by the Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals course, which is immediately after pilot training, which just bridges the gap between basic airplane flying to a little bit of tactical introduction moving into an actual fighter platform. So yeah. did those things and then on to B course, we call it, or the FTU, the formal training unit in the F-15E, which was uh, at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. Yep. And then we've had a few guests on the show that were or are currently there. Yeah, no, that's right. I know some of those names. Uh, yeah, I got Morgan Curridan is, I think, maybe just finished yeah. at this point. Slider Heyman is back, or was back anyway. And then Yeah, he's an instructor there, or at least it w was at the time that we interviewed him. Yeah, and then Wham Reasoner, I think, is another Strike Eagle guy you guys have had on. Yep. All great folks. Which is also to say that the Strike Eagle community is actually pretty small, that you're going to know the majority of people, or you cross paths with most people in your year group at some point. Very true. Very true, which is one of the cool things about it. Yeah, so I went to about nine months worth of uh, the B course there in North Carolina and then was lucky to get an assignment for an operational tour in England at RAF Lake and Heath. Okay, cool. Uh, which has the Strike Eagle. So my wife and I went over there, enjoyed about three years and three months in England and got to travel all around and have some really rewarding operational experiences in the Strike Eagle. And at the end of that assignment, that's the first time in the pilot training pipeline, if you will, that after your first operational assignment, at least in the fighter world, is the first time you have a little bit more flexibility, if you will, or a little bit more say in what you might want to do next. Yeah. And I don't know, in the fighter world, for whatever reason, for better or for worse, it's like a little taboo to come back to white jets, we call it, or come back to training. Yeah. But to me, it sounded like a pretty cool job to come back. And so now I'm an instructor in the Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals course here at Shepard in the NJIP program, and I'm loving it. I think it's a great job, super rewarding for sure. Yeah, very good. And how many years have you been in the Air Force up to this point? I am somewhere closing in on nine years, I think, at this point in the okay. Air Force, I cool. believe. Yeah. So in that amount of time, you've obviously you spent two years doing the training piece, and then you had that time at Seymour Johnson, you spent some time at Lake and Heath doing the operational thing, and now you're at uh, Shepard, like you just said, teaching fighter fundamentals at NJEPT. How long have you been there? How much more time do you have there? Yeah, so I have now been here about two years, almost exactly two years to the day, and still have essentially two years to go. So two years to go in this assignment. Okay. Yeah, before moving on to something new, approximately. 
Okay. Any inkling on what that might be? That's a great question, Colin. I'm hoping to wake up some morning with an epiphany about exactly what I want to do after this assignment. But the good news is I still have probably another year before I need to know. Okay. Lots of options. So trying to figure it out. I thought you were going to say you were hoping that to wake up one day with an assignment to ACC at Langley to go <laughs> fly a desk. That, that's exactly what you want, right? Oh, yeah. To anybody listening, that's probably not. But who knows? <laughs> who knows? We'll see. <laughs> well, very good. Okay. So let's get into the discussion around Inject itself, the reason that people are here today, why they're tuning in. They want to know more about Inject, the program. Okay. What is it? Why does it exist? We covered a little bit of where it is. It's there at Shepherd in Wichita Falls, Texas. But give us you know, the five W's and the how of Ingept and its mission. Yeah, sure. So Ingept is a kind of a unique pilot training program in a couple of ways. So first, it's unique in that it is specifically designed and focused on training fighter pilots. So the traditional pilot training bases, or I don't know if to call them traditional, just the other pilot training bases, you know, all of these students start out in the T-6 as the first airplane in pilot training. And then halfway through pilot training, at the end of T-6s is, is a track select. And then they all go to either the T-1 for folks who are headed to fly heavy type aircraft, cargo, tankers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And then uh, kind of a, typically a smaller number of folks track to the T-38, which is our fighter trainer jet. And those are folks that are headed to typically fly fighters or bombers. The other bases, Columbus, Vance, Laughlin, all are structured that way. Yeah. Whereas Ingept is specifically designed to generate fighter pilots. So everybody who goes to Ingept will start in the T-6, but then everyone tracks into a T-38. So we don't, we don't have any T-1s here at Shepard Air Force Base. And that's the mission is to train NATO fighter pilots. And that kind of alludes to the second really unique thing about Ingept is that it is a NATO run program for NATO pilot trainees. So the instructor cadre, it's probably, I don't know, ballpark 50% or so American, but then 50% IPs from other NATO countries. So you're walking around the halls with Germans, Italians, Spaniards, Greeks, Norwegians, Dutch, folks from the UK, Canada, like it's just a full NATO showing at Shepard both for instructors and students. And so yeah. even the, the folks who come to Inject for pilot training end up in a class with some Americans, but some folks from all of those NATO countries. And it just ends up being a very unique experience. We're able to build partnerships with the folks that we're fighting the downrange fight with in NATO. Right. So it's just a really unique program in that regard and offers just something different than some of the other pilot training options for you. That is really interesting and very cool to think about that, that we are deliberately training the way that we fight. We're not just giving you the skills to operate the aircraft, but we're also giving you the skills to interface with coalition partners, our NATO partners, because it's very rare that we're going to find ourselves in a circumstance where we're operating unilaterally just the United States and don't do anything with other members of NATO. Right. It's unique and it's a very positive thing, in my opinion. And I have examples of times when I've run into one of the guys who was in my IFF, my Intro to Fighter Fundamentals class at Shepard in a mission planning room at Lake and Heath in England. And yeah. he's a Norwegian guy who we just happen to be like, oh man, hey, what's up, man? How are you doing? Like, all right, well, let's plan this thing and go fly it together. So yeah. just a very cool kind of unique opportunity. Yeah, it's cool that the camaraderie is already in place. Obviously, you didn't really stay in direct contact during that time, but there was still a recognition there so that when you did show up to do the mission, that rapport was already there and you were able to just pick up and be that much more effective because that mutual understanding and respect was already in place. Yeah, I, I agree. And that was exactly my experience. And it's pretty cool. Very cool thing. Yeah. So I have to wonder, though, why is the Air Force in charge of this program? Why are we doing this as opposed to maybe the Navy doing this as opposed to you know, the United Kingdom, the Royal Air Force being the ones in charge? Why are we the ones that are doing it. And maybe that's a little bit above your pay grade to say exactly <laughs> why that is the way it is, but maybe pontificate just a little bit on why you think the Air Force is taking the overall charge for the NJET program. 
Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I, I do think up front, I think it's probably a little bit above my pay grade and understanding of the big picture. But I, I do know that Egypt has been around for quite some time. You know, it's gone like 50 years or something at this point. Yeah. And it's not that we are running it per se. It's like Shepard Air Force Base is just the host location of this program. And it is not a U.S. Air Force run program. It is a NATO run program. And so, oh, okay. so it is run by NATO and anything when we look to, you know, change the syllabus or change the training in any way, you have to get buy-in from every country that's present at Egypt. And so it goes to, oh. uh, I believe what's called the NATO steering committee. Uh, and they, you know, it's got a representative from every country that's a part of Egypt and they discuss it and iterate the plan. And at the end of the day, everybody buys in and then the change is made from there. So we're just the host location, I guess, here. But as to why it's the Air Force versus the Navy, that is a good question. And that's not to say that Navy pilot training or whatever doesn't have exchange opportunities. And I know that there are also, you know, international students at the other pilot training bases as well. Yeah. So it's not to say that it's entirely unique, but the fact that it is NATO run and has such a presence of NATO instructors and students, it certainly is unique at Shepard. Yeah, so that's a really good thing that you clarified for me. I didn't realize, I mean, obviously, I don't know that much about it to begin with, but I didn't realize that it wasn't an Air Force program. It is a NATO program and that it just happens to be housed on an Air Force base. Yeah, that's exactly right. And even like our operations group commander, at Shepard, you know, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I believe it's always international. Like currently our operation group commander is a German. Okay. It's often either German or Italian has traditionally been the nationality of our ops group commander. But that just allows like in the chain of command directly there is an international 06 as just a mouthpiece for the NATO side of the house. So it's fully integrated. You mentioned that the Navy pilot training happens elsewhere and there is an opportunity for international exchange. Are there any Navy pilots that will go through NJEPT? I believe the answer to that is no. I've never seen one in my time, and I, I, I think not. Oh, that is interesting. And I also am not sure, like when I say that there are international exchanges in the Navy pilot training, I'm also not sure about that. I'm assuming yeah. that's probably the case. But no, yeah, in terms of pilot training pipelines, yeah, Navy and Air Force don't mix too much. Honestly, we do things slightly differently, not when it comes to fighting the joint fight, but in terms of the training portion, typically a little bit different. Sure, yeah. And you're welcome to say that we do it better, right? Well, we'll neither <laughs> confirm nor deny, but. <laughs> okay, very good. So we have a better understanding of why NJEPT exists to begin with. We're focused on producing fighter pilots specifically for NATO, but it is possible to come out of NJEPT not as a fighter pilot, right? There are some graduates that will go on to fly heavies or bombers or something like that. Yes, Absolutely. And I'll go back to our timing discussion. Just a lot depends on timing and needs of the Air Force, right? So there have been times, like traditionally, NJEPT is definitely a fighter-centric program. And when the nation, and specifically now that the U.S. Air Force really is what I'm speaking to, the other nations, you would do their, their assignments slightly differently. But for the U.S. Air Force, hey, when we need fighter pilots, which right now we do need fighter pilots, the vast majority of drops are indeed for fighter aircraft. And the heavies are fewer and further between. Sometimes, and not always, but sometimes when an individual gets a heavy platform like a C-130, C-17, something like that, sometimes when you get to the end of the program, like they're constantly doing evaluations and determining your aptitude for follow-on training and all that stuff. And for, yeah. for someone who's maybe just struggling a little bit, they determine you know the platform that's best suited for that individual. And sometimes it's not a fighter platform. But what is maybe this is a perfect opportunity to clear up one kind of a bad piece of information that's been floating around. Okay. Is that there are folks who come to NJEP for pilot training desperately wanting something other than fighters. And they're being told by their commissioning sources, like, well, hey, no, go to NJEP and compete with the best, get the highest quality training there is. Uh, and you can still get your C-17 or you can still go to special operations at the end of the day. And while... Yeah. That is a possibility. Since it's a fighter-focused program, if there are only fighters available in the drop, even if you from day one said, I want to go fly a special operations platform or a C-17 or something, yeah. you may at the end of the day be stuck flying a fighter. So I think there's some gouge out there amongst the commissioning sources that you know, people are encouraging people to come to NJEP, even if they say they want to fly something other than fighters. And I would recommend against it because what we've been seeing lately is folks go into fighters who didn't necessarily end up wanting to go to fighters. No, that's really good information. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to clear up. I don't know what the source is for that misconception, but yeah, it's good to get it out of the way. 
Yeah. So now that we have that better understanding of what NGEPT is, why it exists, the results that come from the program, I want to get more into the day in the life of being there at NGEPT. And I want to do it from the instructor perspective because we already did the interview with Morgan Curtin. You know, his interview is specifically about undergraduate pilot training, but, you know, he went through NGEPT. And so if you want to learn more about the experience from the student side, we recommend that our audience go take a look at that episode. And so I want to hear more from your perspective over the last two years as an instructor, having gone and done the operational Air Force thing, come back to NGEPT as an instructor. What has that been like? What is the spin-up process for becoming an instructor? What is it like on the day-to-day basis? Help us peek into what life is like there as an instructor. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And of course, I'll speak from my own perspective on this one and feel free to jump in with questions and whatnot as I go for whatever you think might be meaningful to the audience. It's funny to me, after having gone through Egypt and then having been stationed in England for my ops tour in the Strike Eagle, it's funny. I feel like I don't know anything other than like a international experience when it comes to going to work and doing the job. So it feels very natural to me. I don't know, just the atmosphere, if you will. But yeah, coming back, you're starting with the basics of how do you become an instructor when you get back to Egypt? Well, I alluded to it before. There are two pilot training programs within Egypt, I guess you could say. One is the kind of the UPT side, which is just the pilot training where folks are going from the T6 to the T38. And so if you come back as an instructor to Egypt, you may be a T6 instructor pilot or a T38 instructor pilot on the UPT side. Okay. Or in my case, I am instructor pilot in the Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals course, which is the one that the students go to right after receiving their wings, after completing the T-38 phase of training. And then for those who are going on to a fighter aircraft, they come to the program that I teach in for about another three months worth of training, where we give them a little taste of an introduction to both air-to-air dogfighting and air-to-ground bombing before they go on to the more complex aircraft to do it on their own. So for folks who go to the T-6 or T-38 as instructors, they go through a pit. They call it, I think, pilot instructor training. Okay. And it's a pretty long course, actually. I'm not sure exactly how many rides or exactly how long it takes. It depends. Like, the length of the course depends on how quickly you move through it. Right. But they train very rigorously to be able to teach students from day one. And they've never flown in the aircraft. They've never landed in it. They have to get, you know, very good at doing all those basic things from the rear cockpit. Right. So that the student can sit in the front seat and then the instructor uh, in the back seat to coach them through. And then, so they do the pit and then they're on the line like, training the young students with really no background. And then in my case, I teach in the IFF program where we do our own in-house upgrade. We call it the UIP or the Upgrade Instructor Pilot Program, which is about four to six months upgrade. You know, we just learn our own mission sets, which are these uh, air-to-air and air-to-ground employment type of missions. We learn how to do them initially recalling in the T-38 or learning the T-38 and how to fight in that aircraft, and then learn how to do all those things from the back seat so we as well can have the students sitting in the front and, and coach them through, get them yeah. the basic pictures of, of offensive and defensive BFM, we call it, or basic fighter maneuvers, which is the yeah. technical term for dogfighting kind of thing. So that's just the nuts and bolts of how do you become an instructor and get on the line? Yeah. And you said that takes a number of months. Is there ever like a delay or do you expect that as soon as you show up from fresh off your PCS, you're going to roll right into that? Or is there some time spent maybe in a casual status as you're waiting for the pit or the UIP to kick off? Yeah, it's a great question. A little bit dependent, but it's certainly nothing like on the pilot training side where it is common for a second lieutenant to show up for pilot training and sit on casual status for as much as like six months or something like that. On the instructor side, I mean, we maybe show up anywhere from one to four weeks or something before a course start date. So typically not much sitting time. It's more just enough to get your family set up in a new house and get rolling on a new upgrade. Yeah, so then you get through PIT or UIP or whatever other training that you need to do, and now you're badged as an IP, you're an instructor pilot. Mm -hmm. What happens now? What is the day in the life like for an IP? Well, I think it's some differences from the UPT side to the IFF side, but typically as an instructor, we'll fly twice a day, I'd say is a typical day. 
Okay. And we'll, whatever phase the students are in at the time, we'll, you know, focus on that one. And you show up in the morning, I don't know, at least on the IFF side, we fly four goes a day, if you call it that. So I'd be an instructor either in the first and third go or the second and fourth go to give you enough time in between your two flights to like grab a quick bite of lunch or something, or at least yeah. make sure you get a thorough debrief in. So you show up to uh, usually the schedule. We've got phenomenal schedulers and they'll put out the schedule the day before. So you know what you're doing and you can expect uh, and plan around that. Yeah, show up in the morning to walk into your first flight brief. And again, be in NATO that I could be instructing a Norwegian student yep. or a Dutch student or you know whoever it may be. There's certainly no thought ever to like, ooh, you know, like a certain pairing certain nations or anything like that. It's just everybody is one, right? We are all together. And so yeah. could be anyone. You'll go through a full air-to-air mission, come back, debrief it and then get ready to do the next mission, which sometimes could be then an air-to-ground mission in the afternoon or something else. Of course, that's IFF-specific, but typically two a day, both with uh, briefs and debriefs, and then in and around that, getting the standard office work stuff done at some point, heading home for the day, I suppose. Yeah, so you mentioned that there's no like real rhyme or reason to the pairing of nations or nationalities of instructor and student. Mm-hmm. And so not only are you having to reckon with that you are trying to teach somebody who has no clue how to fly the jet, <laughs> but you are also having to do that potentially for somebody where English is not their second language. And there are accents and different understandings of vocabulary and mannerisms. So it sounds like there's a lot of complexity going on here. You know, talk me through that a little bit. How do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, there is some added complexity, but for me, as a native English speaker, I can recognize that I do not have the short end of this stick, if you will. Right. <laughs> like, I can't imagine, I mean, you know, learning how to fly complex fighter type aircraft and do these complex missions that we do, I just can't fathom doing it in your second language when right. uh, there are certain words that you just don't know. And we obviously encounter that from time to time. Not too often. I mean, these students who come to learn at Egypt, usually their English is pretty phenomenal. Yeah. And the instructors as well, especially so. And so very rarely is there a significant language barrier that's difficult to overcome. I mean, obviously certain international instructors will maybe use a phrase or something that isn't exactly right, but you can figure out what they're saying. Right. And I certainly have to find myself as an instructor trying to avoid you know, traditional idioms, uh, English idioms that are yeah. confusing or don't make sense. And you kind of have to gauge your student depending on their level of English knowledge and what they know. So there's a little bit of that. But after having you know flown in England a little bit and flown you know downrange in foreign countries and stuff, I actually find that there's actually quite a bit of legitimate training value in doing that. Because if it's not a small language barrier between your instructor and me as a student at Egypt, well, maybe it's now a language barrier between myself leading a four ship of strike eagles and a foreign air traffic control agency. And you just have to work through it, yeah. like figure it out, say it in a different way, just do it live, if you will, to get the result that you need. So I think it's all valuable training at the end of the day. Yeah. And then just the cultural learning, the emotional intelligence, the empathy that is developed you know, through that kind of trial and error, figure out a way, learn to communicate in a way that is going to be successful, going to be effective, is really valuable. Again, training the way that we fight, just like you said, you may find yourself having to work with a foreign agency or foreign pilots and don't have you know the exact right answer. You just got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, that's the name of the game. And so, yeah, starting it, that's the idea. You get exposed to other cultures, other, you know, schools of thought, backgrounds, experiences, all that kind of stuff. And especially when you're a student at NGIP and you spend, you know, 55 weeks worth of pilot training with folks from these countries, you really get to know them. You get to know them yeah. really well. You know, develop inside jokes. You learn all sorts of stuff about their background, where they come from, and it all pays off, you know, in the NATO fight that we're doing real world. Yeah, that sounds amazing. So I want to go back just a little bit more on the day in the life of an instructor at Injept. You you say that you fly twice a day. Is that going to be with the same student twice, or are you going to have different students? Uh, are we talking you know a short thirty minute sortie? Are we talking three hours up in the air? How much time are we talking about spending with these students and also in the aircraft itself? That's a great question. So 
the sortie duration, sortie is the term we use for a flight, basically. The duration, it, it depends on whether you're flying the T6 or the T38. The T6 okay. doesn't burn gas nearly like the T38 does, so they can actually fly for two hours or probably even three or more uh, on a yeah. given sortie. They don't usually, but so the folks on the T6 side are actually in the air a lot longer than the folks on the T38 side. Okay, interesting. But they're typically, their brief and debrief is going to be just a little bit shorter, I think. This is all generalization, so someone could probably call me out on being slightly wrong. But Yeah, and they will. <laughs> yeah, sure. Generally <laughs> speaking, that's the idea. On the T-38 side, we're typically flying for about exactly an hour. So sometimes like a 0.9 of an hour up to like 1.1. You know, on the UPT side, when they're just flying around practicing like instrument approaches, stuff that doesn't burn much gas, maybe even a little bit longer than that. But in the IFF program, we're flying pretty aggressive of maneuvering using a lot of afterburner, which burns tons of gas. Right. So typically our sorties are pretty quick. But on the IFF side of the house now, our brief and debrief requirements are a little bit more robust. When we're doing pretty complex fighting, maneuvering, we're coming back and debriefing for probably a hour and a half or so well, would be the duration. When on the UPT side, maybe just to try to coach someone through, hey, we did several landings today. Here were your trends. Here's how you can improve. Maybe you take more like 30 to 45 minutes on the debrief side of that. Okay. Something like that. All generalizations. But yeah, typically flying twice a day. And I'd say usually not with the same student. Okay. It's not so common that we have students that double turn, we call it, when we have a student that flies like two flights in a row. Okay. That's actually quite demanding when you're going through training. So we try to avoid it. It happens probably more so on the UPT side of the house uh, than on the IFF side of the house. It does happen sometimes if someone, either they're crunched on their timeline or there are just two flights that maybe uh, fit well together just to do one yeah. after the other. So it does happen. Very dependent, though, very dynamic. And just no day is the same. Right. That's for sure. Yeah. So any given day, you're going to see a student from Germany and then a student from Turkey. You're going to be, yeah. again, dealing with those cultural dynamics on the regular and having to figure out how to navigate that multiple times per day. Certainly. Yeah, it's always going to be different. And so honestly, I think kind of one of the good things about it is like, you don't even really think about it. Yeah. Like I never have a conscious thought like, oh, I'm flying with a German tomorrow morning. Like that's just, that doesn't really enter my thought process. It's like, I'm going to go train that mission the way I always train that mission, regardless of the nationality. And at the end of the day, we, you know, generate a product that's, I mean, extremely similar. Like you get a, a German pilot that stands next to an American pilot. It's the same product, you know, so pretty cool in that regard. Yeah, that's actually really cool to think about, like how we do with our basic military training and our commissioning sources, it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, we're going to put you through this training program and we're going to get a similar product regardless of the input. The output is still going to be high quality and capable of carrying out the Air Force and the NATO mission. Yeah, absolutely. That's really cool to think about. Well, very good. Okay, so what else do people need to know about daily operations there at NGEPT? Anything that you think is going to be of value to our audience? Let's think. Anything else about daily ops? You know, obviously there's a camaraderie involved as well. Like I haven't really touched on that, but you know, each squadron's got like their own heritage room, yeah. which just further facilitates this kind of cultural immersion, if you will, where like not only are we going and flying and doing the job, also, of course, doing some office work you know, in and around the flights. But then at the end of the day, just hanging out with these folks and sharing stories about like hanging out with the the Belgian, you know, pilot who's got 3,500 hours and was the Belgian demo pilot yeah. and like that kind of stuff. So you're just learning about all these stories and different perspectives that people have from over the years. And hopefully the students are around as well, just absorbing and listening and, and looking forward to the next step. So that's also a big part of the experience and what we do. Yeah, I'm assuming you're familiar with the term shoot the watch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like using your hands to make plane shapes and stuff yes. in the bar. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and so that's what's going on in the heritage room. There might be a choice beverage. There's a, a boisterous <laughs> tale being told. Hands are flying around. Watches are being shot. That's what's going on in the heritage room, right? That's the day in the life right there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I'm glad that you brought that up because that is a really big part of not just the fighter culture, but, you know, it's part of the Air Force heritage and the military heritage, mm -hmm. that place that people gather, share stories, honor the legends of men and women, past and present, you know, the great and heroic things that they've done, honoring especially those that have passed. That's what the Heritage Room is all about. Absolutely. Air Force, uh, yeah, military in general, deeply rooted in heritage and, and should be, you know, for good reason. And so, reveling in that and passing it on to the next generation is, yeah, critical, I think. 
And I think, you know, it's probably not built into the actual curriculum for NGEP, but that's a huge part of the training that goes on there is the sharing of those stories, the rubbing of shoulders and, and being in that type of environment is critical to becoming a pilot for NATO for the Air Force. That's right. And the introduction to fighter fundamentals program, kind of the certainly, yeah, not in the curriculum or the syllabus at all, but we take pride in trying to introduce these students. They have been introduced a little bit throughout the pilot training, the T6 is T38, into like what it's going to be like to be a fighter pilot. But in IFF, especially since we now have a instructor cadre of all instructor pilots, you know, we introduce them to this is the culture that you can expect to be a part of in the fighter world. And it's just the kind of the first little introduction to that. And certainly the camaraderie and heritage is a big part of it. Sadly, during these COVID days has cramped yeah. our style a little bit in that regard. So we're certainly looking forward to that being a thing of the past so we can continue full bore. Yeah, absolutely. Well, very cool. So I want to know now any recommendations that you have for someone who is already a pilot, maybe went through Inject, maybe didn't, but is interested in being an instructor there. What are some things that they should be considering? What are some things that maybe they can prepare themselves for in order to get selected and get an assignment there as a IP inject? Yeah, well, let me speak first specifically to the folks, whether they went through Egypt or not, but folks in the fighter world, like fighter pilots in ops yeah. um, abroad, I can speak in an educated fashion in that regard anyway. So I'll start there. So in order to have the opportunity to come back and teach at Egypt, first of all, in the fighter world, until not too long ago, going back to teach an IFF was as far back as the Air Force would allow a fighter guy to go. They wouldn't allow a fighter guy to go to teach in T-6s or T-38s, except in maybe in an extreme circumstance. Yeah. So IFF was it. And the keys to the castle in that regard was simply you needed to achieve a four-ship flight lead qualification in ops. Okay. We could get into that. It's a whole other topic. But when you're in the fighter ops life, right, you're going through upgrades, a two-ship upgrade, a four-ship upgrade, depends a little bit on your community. But yeah. And then an instructor pilot upgrade is the end of that spectrum. But if you achieve at least a four-ship flight lead upgrade, now you are qualified to go back and be an IFF instructor. I think there also is an hours minimum. Yeah. And I, honestly, I don't know what it is. I think it's 500 hours, but I'm not 100% sure. And so there are waivers for folks that are just shy of that, but trying to get some hours and get a four-ship qual would allow you to come back to IFF. I think, though, things are changing. They always are, right? That's the norm, right? Because I think that the latest assignment that just dropped for fighter folks abroad actually has a lot of folks going back to be T6 instructors or T38 instructors. And that's the first time that's happened in a while. Okay. So take everything that I'm saying right now, listeners, <laughs> with a grain of salt, because it just changes every you know three to six months. There's something different that's happening. So as with anything, I'd say, Colin, like for even non-fighter folks and whatnot, I think the general rule of thumb is simply if you can you know, do well, right? In whatever position you're in, you're always going to have a little bit more sway on what you'd like to do next. So I don't know, I feel like that's the most basic term. But you know, for folks, you know, out there in the heavy world right now, I'm not sure exactly what their VML looks like, or their assignment yeah. list and opportunities, how many there are, or exactly what the key to the castle is, if that's what you want. So it's hard to say, but that's a start anyway. I think it would be easy enough to just say it's exactly the same as getting selected for Egypt as a student. You can go back to what you were saying earlier about making your own luck, that mm -hmm. you need to demonstrate that you're committed to the Egypt community, or at least what it stands for, producing the best possible fighter pilots for the Air Force and for NATO, controlling the things that you actually can control and accepting the things that you cannot, demonstrating that you are someone who's going to contribute to your community that you're going to be a team player. I mean, these are the same things, the same principles that hold true for getting selected to be a student at Inject, being an instructor at Inject, being selected for any possible career development opportunity that is out there in the Air Force or in the military just in general. The same things hold true. Yeah, agree. No, it's 100% true. Agree on all accounts. Great. So I want to end our discussion here on Inject, giving you the opportunity to share any sort of highlights or maybe silly lieutenant stories, obviously protecting the innocent here, no names need to be shared, <laughs> but give us a good story, maybe even shoot your own watch while you're doing this. Uh, tell us about something that sticks out in your mind from your two years now there as an IP at Inject. Oh man, that's uh, 
That's a good one. That's open-ended and mm. it's flooding back tons of little <laughs> memories along the way. I mean, you're not dead yet, so it can't be that bad. Uh, oh my goodness. Well, I tell you what, I'll start with one story that involves me almost dying, I suppose. It's funny, <laughs> if the individual who I was flying with on this moment listens to this, I want him to send me a note on Facebook so we can reminisce about this moment. But <laughs> Yeah, okay. Well, so actually, it goes back to my very first flight as an instructor. Awesome. So I had just finished the instructor upgrade. And so I get sent on the line to do what we call a DB1 sortie, which is the first defensive BFM ride that the student experiences. And what that means is now we're doing BFM, basic fighter maneuvers, air-to-air -air engagement, except that the student is now the defensive aircraft. They're in a bad spot and literally the bandit is on their six o'clock, right? Yeah. So like they're behind him and now we're trying to teach the, the wingmen, we'll call them wingmen because they have wings now, but they're just upgrading to become, you know, a fighter pilot. So we'll call them a wingman. Yeah. So the wingman, he's sitting in the front seat, I'm in the back seat, and he is now trying to not get shot by yeah. the bandit. Okay, that's the idea. So first of all, this is an adventure sortie because this is the first time that they're doing this. They're trying to fly specific parameters while they're literally twisting around and looking behind them. Yeah. They're pulling G's, they're exhausted. And it's just, it's a challenge to coach through that. And I've obviously become better at it. This time was my first time doing it. Yeah. And well, it went okay. It goes okay through all the fights and stuff. And I'm like, whew, all right, I made it. Like survived my first instructor ride. Yeah. But we're still in the airspace at this time. And now it's time to go home. So I take a deep breath. And on this particular day, we're doing a, what we call a student-led RTB. RTB stands for return to base. So basically like a couple of flights in the syllabus where the student has to lead the formation back. Maybe simulating a time when, hey, the flight lead gets a radio problem and can't lead. So the, the student has to know how to navigate back to the field kind of thing. So at first glance, it sounds simple, but hey, after doing this defensive BFM flight, like the you know, poor kid's exhausted, right. a little bit behind mentally and all that stuff. And so as he starts leading us home, he clears the flight lead aircraft into a close formation, we call it. So we're right now like a mile apart or something. And now the flight lead's starting to rejoin to, no kidding, a like a three feet of wingtip clearance position. So a very close yeah. position. So we can look each other over, make sure the jets are fine. And as he's leading us home, he starts pointing directly at some restricted airspace. Oh, no. Okay, so an airspace that we cannot fly through. And so I'm sitting here as the instructor. I'm like, okay, how do I coach the student through, right. like recognizing that he can't keep pointing us straight and all this stuff. And so we talk about it a little bit. And then finally, the light bulb turns on. He realizes, oh, I do have restricted airspace there. And I need to turn the formation away from that immediately. And he had forgotten that he had cleared the other aircraft into a close formation. So here he is, that aircraft is now closing in maybe like 10 feet away, oh, no. 15 feet, 10 feet away. And as he sees that restricted airspace, he freaks out a little bit and does an aggressive turn, like immediately directly into the aircraft that's now only about 10 feet away from Whoa. us. And it was almost so rapid that I didn't even have time to react and take the aircraft. Fortunately, the instructor in the other plane you know, saw that moment happen and pulled away maximum G to get out of the way. And that was my first ever experience flying with a, a wingman. Uh, so <laughs> that was uh, my first experience and my probably still to this day, my closest near death experience. And I came back, my world was uh, rocked a little bit, if you will. And uh, I ended up having to hook my first student ever. Hook is the term we use for like failing a student on a ride, basically for causing an unsafe situation. Yeah. <laughs> that was one that stuck with me to this day. Glad you're still here. <laughs> I'm assuming that student pilot made it through and he's still totally. with us. Okay. He totally, or she know. You know, <laughs> yeah. don't want to you know, assume anything. <laughs> no, he's a great guy. Great pilot. And got through the program mighty, mighty fine. But that was just one moment that <laughs> was 40 to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. I mean, there's so much more that we could get into two years there at NJEPT, not including your time there as a student as well. So we'll have to pause it there, but also open up the opportunity for um, members of our audience to get in touch with you. And so if they do have questions, if they do want to ask you a little bit more, either from the perspective of being a student or being there as an instructor, how do people best get in touch to ask those questions? Yeah, well, I am, first of all, more than happy to answer those questions that anybody's got on any end of the spectrum there. I mean, I'm around, I'm on Facebook, so people can look me up there. That'd probably be the easiest way, knowing my name. They can look me up and send me a direct message or something like that. Just search for saddle. You'll be the only one that pops up, right? 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I have my call sign on my Facebook. I, I don't outright identify myself as a fighter pilot through and through <laughs> a, a person uh, as well. But but yeah, Kirk Morrow is my name. So I can be looked up there. And then, of course, if a friend of a friend or something, happy to pass my phone number, email address or whatever as well to get in touch with me. Yeah, very good. And also anybody that's got access to the global, they can look up your email address there. Certainly. And if yeah. nothing else, they can send their questions to Air Force Officer Podcast at gmail.com. We'll be happy to field those and forward them on to you. Okay, Saddle, this has been fantastic, but I've got one last question for you to wrap this up. What does it mean to be an officer? Oh, yeah, threw that one on me. Being an officer, you could take it any number of directions, but to be an officer is to lead by example. I think you like live the values that you try to exemplify to your subordinates, to your friends, to your family. Like I said, be a good person, be a good teammate, be a you know, person of integrity. And I think all that kind of aligns itself to be able to get the mission done. And in a team sense, whether that be the folks in your flight, you know, the folks in all of NATO or whatever, live by upstanding principles and whatnot. And yeah, I think that then creates a foundation to be able to work together and then get the mission done day in, day out. Yeah, absolutely. Being a person of integrity, having that high moral character is critical to mission execution. It's not just being competent at the stick. It's not just being able to read a chart, recognize a pattern, put together a fantastic PowerPoint presentation, whatever your skill set is. You have to have that integrity in place. Otherwise, things are just going to fall apart. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Thank you so much, Saddle, Captain Kirk Morrow. It's been a wonderful pleasure to speak with you, get to know you, learn a little bit more about NJEPT. This has been super valuable for me. I hope it's been valuable for you and for our audience. Anything else that you want to leave with us before we wrap up here? Nothing else. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I had a great time. Thank you very much. So, Reed, what did you think of the discussion with Saddle? It was good. I've sent a few students to NJEP. I've known some people that have gone through, but I've never really sat down and listened and heard what it is about that organization and that training that makes us special. So I really appreciated that background and information. I certainly learned a lot. Yeah. I've heard about NJEP through my time in Air Force ROTC. It was something that got brought up every once in a while in the operational Air Force. But this interview really opened that up and made it clear to me why NJEPT is so important, not only to the Air Force, but in the broader context, especially if you think about our episode from last week, NATO, and what we're trying to do with our coalition partners. Yeah, exactly. I was just going to say, it really builds. And what better thing to continue us on in this idea of how to develop ourselves? You know, Saddle's definitely thinking about that and trying to get as good as he can at his craft. And some of the lessons he taught, just they apply everywhere. But before we go into those ideas, I wanted to talk about how OTS does NJEP selection. Okay. Because, you know, there may be some out there who are pilot selects and they're headed to OTS and NJEP is an option for them. Now, when I was there as a student and then when I went back as an instructor, OTS got roughly one NJEP slot per class. Now, that was not a guarantee. NJEP had allocated OTS a certain number of slots per calendar year. And depending on the number of classes, depending on the throughput and requirements and that sort of thing, they would usually select one student from the class per class to go to NJEP. And Reed, real quick, when you say class, give us an idea of how big that pool of candidates is. Yeah. So we would have six line officer training classes a year. Remember now they've merged what used to be that commissioned officer training and the line officer training. They've merged that into one thing. So I'm not really sure how that's shaken out, but we would have about six classes a year when I was an instructor at about 250 per class. Okay. And the composition of pilots to other, it really depended, but we were training a ton of pilots. Yeah. We were hiring. That's a perpetual need. Saddle goes into that when he talked about how important assessing and recruiting flyers are right now. So you were usually competing against at least 50 to maybe even 150 folks there at OTS per class for these spots. And the way it worked is we would give a small, short brief. Usually we'd send it out via email or answer questions to all of the pilots and say, hey, you're a pilot select. You have an opportunity to apply for this. Here are the application requirements. 
those were largely driven by the OTS Commandant. The Commandant during my entire time was a flyer, and that pilot would hold a board. They would review all the applications. They would make a rough assessment of who they thought was going to be successful. They would hold a board. The students would go down. They would be in person for an actual board. They would be in service dress. It was a big deal. Wow, they were actually there in person. Yeah, yeah. They would make it as real as possible because this is such a prestigious program, Colin, that yeah. they really want to make sure that they're sending the right people there. Saddle goes into it. You need to be able to work with people from other nations. You need to be able to fly fighters. That was another thing that was very clear, right? This is a basically a fighter pilot program. Yeah. And so again, right, we talked about how hard charging we are. There's a making it the Air Force cut. Then there's a pilot cut. Then there's go to NJEP. And then there's like fighter pilot. I mean, you are really, really got to be the cream of the crop to get some of these spots. So they would hold a board. And then sometimes they wouldn't select anybody. If they didn't think anybody met that bar for that really elite of the elite, they wouldn't select them. Sometimes they would. I was fortunate enough to send three students to NJEP. One was a reservist, and they had their NJEP slot before OTS. I don't know how that happens. Don't ask me. I, I just it was it never the way came that up. Yeah. Reserve likes to do things differently than yeah. the rest of the Air Force. No clue. But the other two, both of them finished number one and number two in my flights. And they were distinguished graduates. They crushed everything from the minute they showed up. They absolutely deserve to be there. Yeah. And we can see that same sort of level of capability and aptitude in saddle. I mean, yes, absolutely humble guy, but clearly very capable. Is it any surprise to you and me, Reed, that he was selected for Egypt? No. No, <laughs> not at all. I've never even no. met the guy, but I listened to this interview. You and I have talked offline. No surprise at all. Yeah. And just to give an idea of what things are like on the Air Force ROTC side of things, Egypt is incredibly competitive there too. Just like for OTS, Egypt will hold a certain number of spots for ROTC. I imagine the same is true for uh, the Air Force Academy, but there's an even larger pool of applicants. Yeah, massive pool. Mm -hmm. Out of the academy and, and ROTC. And so it actually ends up being that OTS gets far more NJEP slots than per person, per candidate, yeah. than the academy and Air Force ROTC. Mm -hmm. But let's put a caveat on that, right? Yes. OTS <laughs> is the flexible partner in the commissioning program, especially right now, Yeah, because we're seeing it happened. We're seeing the spigot be turned off. Classes are getting canceled. Yes, they're still holding rated boards, but we don't know how much longer that's going to take place. Yeah. So if it is your goal to get to NJEPT and it's awesome to have such a worthy goal and you have an option to go to the academy or you have an option to go to ROTC, do not skip those options in order to take OTS in order to increase your chances at NJEPT. That's a terrible plan. Don't do that. <laughs> Please. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I will say, and maybe this is just that I'm a little biased, but Air Force ROTC Detachment 855, where I was an instructor, yeah. does really well. No bias at all. You're also a graduate at 855, so <laughs> none at all. But not an NJEP grad, right? Not an NJEP yeah. grad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, our program would regularly produce one, maybe two NJEP selects every year, which is unheard of yeah. for ROTC. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know exactly why that is. I could speculate, but, you know, just to keep from making an enemy out of you, Reed, I'll, I'll keep those comments to myself. <laughs> I went to a rival school, shall we say, right? <laughs> anyway, so the point of all of this is to show that NJEPT is extremely prestigious and there are multiple layers of selection that you have to go through in order to get selected for it. And we talked about this with Saddle, like how does somebody get selected for it. And, you know, I really appreciated the level headedness that he brought to it. Mm -hmm. He talked about making your own luck. And he said, there are basically three things that go into this. There's your commitment. There are the things that you can control. And then your what you contribute back to the Air Force. Essentially, he was saying the same thing as we have been saying for over a year now that you have to find the things that you can control and just control the heck out of them. Yeah. But then accept the things that you cannot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And Colin, we think it's worth pointing out 
we recognize that some folks are going to have to make a little bit more luck for themselves than others. Yeah. You know, the number of things that some people can control may be higher for some than it is for others. For sure. And there's not a whole lot we can do about that, but it's going to take some effort on your part. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because there's however many people who want to be part of this, Mm -hmm. just to begin with, it's a huge number of people that are interested in it. But then, yeah, I mean, let's own up front what people are up against in a lot of these circumstances. There are both conscious and unconscious biases against certain groups of people who want to not only become an officer in the Air Force, but then to go become a pilot and then get selected for NJEPT. They have to continually fight against these things that these headwinds that are keeping them from being selected for these different opportunities. And we have to recognize members of our audience who are listening to this have to recognize and accept that, yeah, that is the case. Some of you are going to have to work harder than others. Yeah. And it doesn't mean we also have to like it. Right, Colin? I remember General C.Q. Brown with this focus on on diversity and inclusion and addressing some of these biases that we're dealing with. This is part of our problem, right? This is our Air Force. These are things of our creation to some degree. And he mentioned that in an interview that he gave, you know, a little video that he published, which kind of went viral about how he had to be better than everybody else Mm -hmm. all the time. And we can do better, Colin. We need to do better. Yeah. I mean, we want people who have that kind of mentality, who want to be better than everybody else all the time, but still be able to not burn bridges and still be able to connect with other people like a normal human, right? Yeah. But we need that level of excellence in these programs like NGEPT for the exact reasons that Saddle described in the interview. We're talking about the communication and collaboration with partner nations, with people who do not have English as their primary language. Yeah. And I loved Colin. You asked him, did you think about the nationality or did any of that? And he's like, no, I, we don't even think about it. How amazing is that? Right? That's so inspiring that they just fly. Yeah. They got a student, they got an instructor, they go, they fly, they debrief, they get better. And just what an inspirational thing. And on the, after we talked about NATO last week and we've talked about NJET, which is a NATO program, right? I love that too. That was something I learned. I thought this was an Air Force thing that we like invited NATO to come to. Yeah. That was really, you know, insightful for me. I did not know this was, no, this is a NATO thing that we participate in. Yeah. You know, I really like that, that insight. But, you know, this reminds me of something, Colin, back in 2014, I talk about my deployment a lot. It was a big seminal moment in my life. So How dare you? I know. But one of the very first strikes that happened in Syria, which were incredible because we had people from a ton of nations participating in these airstrikes. And some of the first strikes, we had people from a bunch of our Muslim nation, brothers and sisters in arms, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Qatar, Bahrain, and United Arab Emirates. And one of the flight leads was a Muslim woman. Her name was Maryam al-Mansouri. And she was taking the fight in Syria in an F-16 against ISIS, you know, highly misogynist organization. And that was one of those really important moments where I realized that that is what we're fighting for. Mm -hmm. We are fighting so that that can be a reality. And it was a really moving thing for me to be a part of. Yeah, I mean, talk about the headwinds, talk about the biases and things that you cannot control that you just have to accept sometimes, but you still find the things that you can control and be successful to the point that people cannot tell you no, right? Yeah. Like C.W. Lemoyne, right? Mover. He's got his group there all about like, make them tell you no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect example of that. So for all of you in our audience who are thinking about going to NGEPT or any other special selection program in the Air Force or without, but you're seeing the way to selection is full of barriers and obstacles for you, know that there may still be a way. You just have to make your own luck. You have to make them tell you no. Now, understand there are some things that just are not possible. Reed, I'm sorry, you are an intelligence officer. You are never going to be the chief of staff of the Air Force. 
I, okay, yes, you're right. <laughs> it's, just, it's not going to happen, right, in our lifetime. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. And having that awareness of things that just are not possible is really important. But if there is that inkling of hope, if there is that possibility of something that you want so deeply to happen, then that is where what Saddle has been talking about and what we've been talking about really comes into play. Make your own luck. Control what you can and don't fret the rest of it. Yeah. You know, Colin, something I think that would be really important to bring up right now is, you know, as an OTS instructor, we used to call ourselves the killers of hopes and dreams. <laughs> and, and we did that in jest. When it's late at night, we're grading papers after a 16-hour day. And we have to read another paper on why the A-10 should be still in the Air Force. It, it was hard to get through those days, but we did. We had the power and authority to sign the Form 1 that would get these folks commissioned or not. Yeah. That was delegated to us. And we took that very seriously. And as I look back on that experience, it was really formative. And I think about this Emirati pilot and the, like you said, Colin, the headwinds that she probably had to fight that you and I can't imagine. We are not facing those headwinds. No, we are not. And we recognize that. And so I want to commit to you and, and to our audience that I'm going to be very deliberate in thinking about the headwinds that I may or may not be creating for the people around me, for my brothers and sisters in arms. Yeah. And I want to offer that charge to our audience. I want you to look at yourselves and I want you to ask, am I creating headwinds? Am I making it harder unnecessarily for other people to reach their full potential? And I think as a service, we're not doing that very well right now. And we're trying to get after it. We're not there. But I think we can't just sit here and imagine that, oh, you can work it out because we've shown there is data that some of them just can't and it's not their fault. It's the fault of the people like you and I, Colin, the white men who are in charge of this yeah. that have put barriers in the way. And we got to stop it. Yeah. And we're talking about the success of individuals in their ability to get selected for various programs. But back into the context of NATO, NATO will not be successful. The Air Force, just on its own, will not be successful. And then the United States and then NATO, these ever larger and larger organizations cannot succeed unless we do better at including people who don't look and don't think like us. That is the point of these different organizations. And we need to do our part. You and I read as Christian white men need to own this up front that we are not doing everything that we can, not only to avoid creating the headwinds, but breaking down the barriers that currently exist. Yes. We must be better. Yes, absolutely. And I'm committing, Colin, publicly. It's something I've committed to personally and privately for a long time. But I think there's some real value in saying it out loud and being held accountable by others. Yeah. I'm going to take action in this. I'm going to work actively to get better because what we are doing is worth it. When I see a woman wearing a hijab walking to an F-16 and killing terrorists, that's winning. That's what it looks like. Yeah. And I want to be a part of that. And I want people to identify with her and say they want to be a part of that. And that's what I want to be a part of. Absolutely. Sorry, I got a little emotional there, but it matters. It's worth it. Yeah. The emotion is real. It's raw. And those are the kinds of things combined with some real intellectual rigor and thought is what's going to get us there. So I think that's a great place to leave it. Again, thank you to Saddle for taking the time to share his experience with us, providing the substance for us to have a discussion around to eventually end up at this all important topic of we need to do better for our brothers and sisters, regardless of their background, their color, their ethnicity, or anything like that. And regardless of their nation, right? We need to support others outside of the United States every bit as much as we do on the inside. And that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed.